Committee will come to order. We welcome back to the committee the commander of the U.S. Central Command, General Joseph Votel. We are particularly interested in hearing General Votel's views on the changes that the new national defense strategy brings to his area of responsibility. The strategy's emphasis on strategic competition has implications for a region where Russian influence and presence is much greater now than it was before the Syrian conflict began a region that is one of the targets of the Chinese whole of nation effort to increase its sway, and a region where the Iranians are aggressively expanding its wide arc of control to the detriment of its neighbors. These developments and the continuing threat of terrorism in and emanating from the CENTCOM region suggest that the United States cannot afford to remove our attention or our presence from this vital area. Fortunately, we have a number of strong allies and partners that are able and willing to actively defend our joint interests. But as we have painfully learned in recent years, there is simply no substitute for the United States. When we withdraw prematurely, the world, including the threats to our homeland, can rapidly grow more dangerous. The challenge, however, is that CENTCOM has received the lion's share of military resources for some time. And while its importance remains, we have to be more active in other vital areas of the world at the same time. The recent budget agreement helps, but it will take time to rebuild and field needed capability. In these circumstances, General Votel has his hands full in making sure that U.S. national security is protected. Let me yield to the acting ranking member, the gentlelady from California, Ms. Davis. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I ask unanimous consent that the ranking member statement be entered into the record. Without objection. Thank you. And I would also like to welcome uh, General Votel and thank him for appearing today. The Central Command area of responsibility remains critical to our national interests, and we have to maintain a focus on security in the region. Reports of continued military progress in the counter-ISIS campaign are encouraging, but military achievements alone, as I think we all know, will not guarantee long-term success. We must work with the international community, employ a whole-of-government approach to foster and to sustain political, economic, and social conditions to ensure long-term stability. We cannot allow the region to fall into violent extremism again. To truly defeat ISIS, we must be just as determined to secure a durable peace as we have been to achieve a decisive military victory. We have long sought a stable end state in Afghanistan. For more than 16 years, the United States has concentrated on eliminating terrorist threats while working closely with our allies and our partners to train, advise, and assist Afghan forces to secure the country. Despite significant progress, Afghan forces are still in need of assistance, so where are we headed? Although our commitments to oppose violent extremism in Iraq, Syria, and Afghanistan are consuming, we must also remain alert to other regional security challenges. Despite an agreement regarding its nuclear program, Iran remains a designated state sponsor of terrorism, and it exerts destabilizing influence in Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, and Yemen. We must deter Iran from precipitating conflict and dissuade it from engaging in malign activities. And we must also deter Russia, that it's increasingly involved in the region as well. Certainly a complex set of issues, General. And I look forward to your testimony. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. General, without objection, your full written statement will be made part of the record. Welcome back. The floor is yours. Uh, Chairman Thornbury, uh, Congresswoman Davis, uh, distinguished members of the committee, good morning and thank you for the opportunity to appear today to discuss the current posture and state of readiness of the United States Central Command. I come before you today on behalf of the over 80,000 members of the command. It is a dedicated team of military service members and civilians, along with our coalition partners, representing 70 nations and four international organizations many of whom are forward deployed across some of the most dangerous areas in the world. They sacrifice and risk on a daily basis, in many cases for the benefit of not only American strategic interests, but also the world's. Our people are the very best at what they do, and they, and especially their families, deserve our admiration and gratitude. 
It is my sincere honor to lead and be a member of such a fine team of dedicated professionals. I am approaching the two-year mark of my time in command. This period has been both incredibly challenging and immensely rewarding during what has arguably been one of the most volatile times in this complex region's history. It has been 11 months since I last appeared before this committee, and since then we have made considerable military progress in Iraq and Syria, Afghanistan, Egypt, Lebanon, and the maritime environment. However, we remain very clear-eyed regarding both the permanence of that progress and the challenges that we face in the future. In the past year, we have achieved incredible success against ISIS in Iraq and Syria. The Iraqi security forces and Syrian democratic forces are operating at their most effective levels since Operation Inherent Resolve began. And now, over 98% of the territory previously held by ISIS in Iraq and Syria is no longer under their control. The destruction of the ISIS physical caliphate is imminent, and millions of displaced persons are returning home and beginning the long process of rebuilding. Now, we must consolidate our gains by investing in the security forces, relationships, and capabilities that will hold the territory and keep ISIS from returning. Based upon that progress, CENTCOM is conducting an operational alignment and rebalancing effort to achieve three specific goals. The first goal is to complete major combat operations in Iraq and Syria and bring the defeat ISIS campaign to a responsible close. Military success in the campaign up to this point presents us an opportunity to reposition some of our resources from Iraq and Syria to Afghanistan in a manner that keeps the pressure on ISIS but also sets us up to break the stalemate in Afghanistan. We retain sufficient capability to continue our efforts against ISIS despite the increasingly complex situation across Syria and especially in the northwest province of Afrin. We are fully engaged with our mission partners in the Department of State to carefully balance our objectives. Our partners on the ground in Syria have advanced us a long way towards our objectives, and we will stick with them through the completion of this fight. In Iraq, the Iraqi security forces are rapidly consolidating gains and preparing to support elections later this spring. The second goal is to prioritize the implementation of the South Asia strategy in Afghanistan. This strategy reaffirms the U.S. government's enduring commitment to Afghanistan by reinforcing the two complementary military missions, the NATO-led train, advise, and assist mission and the U.S. counterterrorism mission. <clears throat> we are making sure that with our support, the Afghan National Defense and Security Forces are well postured to begin operations to seize the initiative, expand population control, and secure credible elections. Part and parcel of this effort is our regionalized approach to engage all countries with a stake in Afghanistan's stability, especially Pakistan. Our goal here is to develop a productive and trustful relationship that benefits both of our militaries and supports our objectives in the region. The third goal is to ensure that we have aligned our military efforts with our broader interagency and international efforts to neutralize, counterbalance, and shape the destabilizing impact that Iran has across the region. Make no mistake, while we continue to confront the scourge of terrorism, Iran's malign activities across the region pose the long-term threat to stability in this part of the world. We view ourselves, the military, as supporting the many other and more effective resources and capabilities of the U.S. government and its partners in this endeavor. The recently published National Defense Strategy rightly identifies the resurgence of great power competition as our principal national security challenge, and we in CENTCOM see the effects of that competition throughout the region. Russia's support of the Assad regime has not only propped them up, but has also added complexity to the defeat ISIS campaign. Diplomatically and militarily, Moscow plays both arsonist and firefighter fueling tensions among all parties in Syria, the Syrian regime, Iran, Turkey, the Syrian Democratic Forces, the United States, and other coalition partners, then serving as an arbiter to resolve disputes, attempting to undermine and weaken each party's bargaining positions. Despite the key role that our partners on the ground, the Syrian Democratic Forces, and the coalition have played in dealing defeat to ISIS, 
Russia has placed this progress at risk with their activities, which are not focused on defeating ISIS, but rather on preserving their own influence and control over the outcome of the situation. It is clear that Russia's interests in Syria are Russia's interests and not those of the wider international community. China is pursuing a long-term steady, long steady economic growth in the region through its one belt, one road policy, but it is also improving its military posture by connecting ports such as Gwadir in Pakistan with its first overseas military base in Djibouti, adjacent to the critical Bab el-Mandeb. While Beijing claims both locations support peacekeeping and humanitarian operations, the new military base and port bolsters China's force projection into the region. Both China and Russia seek to fill in perceived gaps in U.S. interests by increasing defense cooperation and sales of their equipment to our regional partners. They both are also cultivating multidimensional ties to Iran. The lifting of UN sanctions under the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action opened the path for Iran to resume membership application to the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. In addition, Russia, supported by Iran, continues to bolster a friendly regime in Syria, limit, attempt to limit our U.S. military presence in Iraq and Afghanistan, and create friction among NATO partners. Against this backdrop of increasing great power interaction, are the enduring issues of the region, social, economic, and political challenges, high unemployment, falling oil prices, a youth bulge, large numbers of refugees and internally displaced persons, and longstanding border conflicts. We in CENTCOM stand ready with all of our partners to defend U.S. interests against these and other threats. Our strategic approach of preparing the environment, pursuing opportunities, and working to prevail wherever we can is working. We are postured for purpose, proactive in pursuing opportunities, and resolved to win. I'd like to close by sharing three dynamics that we assess are essential to prevailing in this region. First, as I have previously testified in the conduct of our campaigns in Iraq, Syria, and Afghanistan, as well as our operations in places like Yemen, Lebanon, and Egypt, we have adopted a by, with, and through approach that places a heavy reliance on indigenous partner nation forces. Our partners do not always want us to solve their problems for them, so we enable them to stand on their own. And while this approach does present its own challenges and can be more time consuming, it, pr it provides local solutions to local problems. This approach is not without risk as we are seeing unfold in Syria today, but in general, it is proving very effective and will likely pay significant dividends going forward. Secondly, Successful pursuit of U.S. objectives in this region only comes from an integrated approach aligned with interorganizational partners. Defense of the nation is a team sport. This applies not just within the command, but with our fellow combatant commands, our component commands, our established combined and joint task forces, the central region's 18 country teams, and other departments, agencies, and organizations of the U.S. government who have provided unwavering support over almost two decades of persistent conflict. Our allies in the region and the wider international community are equally as critical to supporting our mission. They directly support the CENTCOM headquarters with more than 200 foreign military officers from 49 nations, all of whom are part of the success of CENTCOM and we are grateful for and largely depend upon their partnership. As the national defense strategy captures clearly, Strengthening existing relationships and building new ones will be key to our future success. We are doing this in CENTCOM every day. Finally, we could not do what we do on a daily basis without the support of Congress and by extension, the American people. We sincerely appreciate this committee's continued strong support for our operations, authorities, and resources, and especially the same to the services, Special Operations Command, and other defense agencies that we rely upon for, for our military wherewithal. Your support will remain important as we contend with what potentially are generational struggles to defend our homeland from the threats outlined in our national defense strategy. U.S. government commitment to the CENTCOM area of responsibility is more important now than ever. For our part, 
we will support the third pillar of the national defense strategy, business reform, by continuing to be good stewards of the resources and authorities that Congress provides us. To close, I want to once again thank the outstanding men and women who comprise the United States Central Command, easily our finest and most precious resource. They continue to make great sacrifices and contributions to ensure the command meets our strategic objectives and protects our nation's interests. We must ensure they have everything they need to do their jobs as effectively and efficiently as possible. We are also keenly aware and grateful for the sacrifices made by our families. They are vital members of the team and we could not accomplish our mission without them. They too make important contributions and tremendous sacrifices every day to support us. I thank them on behalf of the command and a grateful nation. Thank you again and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, General. Let me remind members that immediately upon conclusion of this open hearing, we will regather with General Votel upstairs in a classified session. So be in touch to know exactly uh, when this uh, open hearing ends. Since uh, General Votel and I have had a chance to visit reason recently, I'm going to yield five minutes initially to the gentlelady from Wyoming, Ms. Cheney. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, General Votel, for your service and for being here today. Um, I wanted to ask you to uh, elaborate uh, in particular on the threat from Iran. And um, you know, one of the many grave flaws of the JCPOA is uh, the fact that it failed to deal with Iran's ballistic missile threat. Uh, and we are now seeing across the region uh, increasingly uh, evidence that Iran is transferring ballistic missiles and other conventional equipment to uh, its, ad its, its allies in the region. Can you talk about exactly what you're seeing in this regard and uh, what DOD is in a position to be able to do to defend us and our allies against that threat? Thank, thank you, Congresswoman. I think you've highlighted the, one of the principal concerns that we have, this, uh, this, the increasing not just quantity but quality of their ballistic missiles uh, and the export and movement of those capabilities to other groups and and uh, and locations around uh, around the uh, around the region. Um, certainly, as we've seen with Ambassador Haley and and her demonstration most recently with some of the items recovered from Saudi Arabia, these weapons uh, pose the threat of widening the conflict out of uh, out of uh, out of Yemen and frankly put. But our forces, our embassy in Riyadh, our forces in, in the United Arab Emirates at risk as well as our partners. So I think first and foremost about their threat is the quality and the quantity uh, that they have been pursuing over the last several years, particularly with respect to this. Um, their direct introduction of asymmetric capabilities concerns me. As we look at places like the Bab al-Mandeb where we see uh, the introduction of coastal defense cruise missiles, uh, some that have been modified, uh, we know these are are not capabilities that the Houthis had, um, so they have been provided to them by someone. That someone is Iran. Uh, the presence of uh, explosive boats, the pres increased presence of mines in this area are all uh, very similar to the layered threat that Iran has posed in the Straits of Hormuz, and, uh, and we hold them accountable uh, for that. So that's a second aspect of this. The third, of course, is their continuing uh, uh, in, in changing power projection model. Not only their own forces, but uh, their proxies and the partners that they are attempting to create around the region. I think these all give us very significant concerns. With respect to your question about what we are doing, we are working with Saudi Arabia and some of our partners to ensure that they are optimizing their capabilities that they have, many of them U.S. Uh, US provided capabilities, uh, to ensure that they can uh, defend themselves. And, and I would report to you in this session that we are seeing some progress in that, in that regard. Thank you, uh, General. And in re respect to Syria, um, could you talk a little bit about, we, there have been reports that we've seen facilities, for example, being built in Syria, reports in, in open source, uh, Iranian missile facilities. Um, obviously, the threat there is significant, not just to U.S. In interests, but also to allies like Israel. Um, and could you talk more about what we might be able to do, particularly on the ground in Syria, uh, as we see the challenge of, uh, we've been very effective against ISIS there, but obviously our interests are still significantly threatened, uh, given the, the failed state situation we're facing. 
Thank you, Congressman. As you know, uh, countering Iran is not one of the coalition missions in Syria. Uh, that said, our, uh, I think one of the most effective things that we can do in this particular area is build strong relationships. General, I'm sorry. Could you just? Uh, I understand it's not potentially formally part of the mission, but it, it it's, uh, seems to me if we're focused on countering Iran, we need to be doing it every place our interests are threatened. Absolutely. And and uh, and one of the key ways that we we uh, we are doing that is through uh, our strong relationships that we're building with uh, the uh, the government of Iraq uh, military forces uh, that include not only forces that are in the interior, but certainly along their border. Our our strong relationship with the Syrian Democratic Forces in the east and in the northern part of the country uh, uh, Put us in a position where uh, we can we can impede uh, uh, Iran's uh, objectives of, of establishing lines of communication through these critical areas and trying to connect Tehran to Beirut, for example. Um, so I think first and foremost, some of these indirect things we're doing are very very important um, uh, to that. I think beyond that, I think also continuing to highlight and illuminate their activities is extraordinarily important, uh, uh, so that. Uh, so that uh, they can be addressed not just with military means, but certainly with the other means that are available to us across government. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll yield back the balance of my time and look forward to discussing this further in the closed session. Thank you. Ms. Davis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and General Votel again. Thank you for, for joining us. As you just mentioned, and, and certainly in, uh, in your written statement, the national defense strategy stated that great power competition, not terrorism, is now the primary focus of U.S. national security. Could you elaborate for us on, on those comments and also talk about the shift in, in this national strategy? How exactly will it impact CENTCOM? And what, if any, significant changes will actually materialize as a result of the shift and how will cent, uh, Central Command's capacity to perform its mission be affected? Well, thanks, I, uh, Congresswoman. I, I think the, the you know the shifts that are outlined in the national defense strategy are, are things that will take place over time, uh, and so you know uh, one of the one of the principal ways that we are uh, trying to uh, try, trying to manage that, of course, is through the development of uh, and, and continued relationship building that we have on place with in place with partners in the region and continuing to strengthen those uh, those relationships. One of the things we have learned through this by with and through approaches is that we can uh, we can do a lot through our partners by providing advice by providing expertise in areas where we uh, have uh, experience and we can do that with uh, with a smaller footprint uh, and uh, and with uh, you know correspondingly smaller investments so I, I think one of the principal ways that we will address this going forward is continuing to build on these relationships and continuing to empower our our partners in the region can you just speak to the key challenges in doing that? Well, I, you know, I think the, certainly one of the key challenges will be making sure that we don't create the uh, create the impression that we are abandoning CENTCOM. And uh, this, of course, is a, is a key talking, or the, the region. And so this, of course, is a key talking point, not only for me, but for all leaders that come in there. We recognize that the, the interest that we have, the national interest that we have in this region for, uh, for preventing attacks on the homeland, for preventing uh, proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, for ensuring freedom of navigation and commerce to the critical straits, for ensuring other countries can't destabilize, those are enduring interests that we will always have. And so this will always require us to continue to be engaged there to some aspect. But of course, the, the Secretary will make decisions on shifting resources in accordance with the National Defense Strategy. Uh, thank you. Uh, you also talked about local solutions, and we know how critical that is, and as you've just, uh, just mentioned. <clears throat> I wonder if you could also talk about the inclusion of women as a critical strategy um, that advances countering terrorism, national security, and democratization, and economic and social development. Um, some of those programs have been successful, um, but there certainly is more to be done. How can we increase the effectiveness of these programs? Well, I, I think the, 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 the best way we can do is by sharing our experiences with us. We, we learned uh, by, by our, our inability to include women into many of our counterterrorism operations that we were missing back in the beginning of our of, of, of these uh, fights that we've been involved in, that we are missing 50% of the population in doing that. And when we, when we began to introduce
introduced them into positions where they could have influence. We learned a lot from that. So I think one of the key things that we can do is continue to, to lead by example in this area and demonstrate how this is valued by us. Uh, I, we do see partners in the region doing this. The Afghans are doing this. The Iraqis are doing this. We certainly see this with the Syrian Democratic Forces that we're working with in, in, uh, in, uh, in Syria. And I would highlight to you that uh, one of the principal commanders that they have, very successful commanders, is a female. Uh, and so it is, it is very much recognized uh, that, uh, that contributions come from, from the entire, entirety of the force. Thank you. I appreciate that. I think that a number of us have participated in those efforts, uh, and I, I hope that we can continue to do more of that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Wilson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. General Botel, recently the United Nations released a gr remarkably gruesome report outlining North Korea's ongoing efforts to assist Syria building chemical weapons. This report states that North Korea has been shipping supplies to the Syrian government, including acid-resistant tiles, valves, and thermometers. Additionally, North Korean missile techno technicians have been observed working at chemical weapons and missile facilities in Syria. Are you able to comment on the UN report? And if not, could you describe the malign and disruptive role North Korea currently plays in Syria and whether or not you see their role expanding in the coming years. Additionally, what is being done to disrupt this cooperation between the dictatorships of North Korea and the Syrian government? Uh, Congressman, I, I admit I have not seen that report, so I can't comment specifically uh, on it. Obviously, we are concerned about the proliferation of these types of weapons in, in Syria with a country that has demonstrated the, uh, the intent to use them. So this will be an area that we will continue to pay close attention to. And it's so important, I was um, actually pleasantly surprised uh, that the New York Times covered it today. Uh, uh, my experience with that newspaper is they frequently overlook uh, threats to uh, stability in the world. Uh, but um, I, I urge uh, your consideration. Uh, also, a, a primary concern for the long-term stability of the Middle East surrounds the return of defeated Islamic State fighters who are returning home from fighting in Iraq and Syria. An estimate from the Sufan Center and the Global Strategy Network have tracked 5,600 fighters who have returned to their home countries. Specifically, sadly, Turkey has 900 returning and Saudi Arabia has 760 returning. Could you explain what threat the return of the defeated Islamic State fighters to their home country represents to the long-term stability in the region? And can you explain the proposed or ongoing efforts to work with ally nations in dealing with this flow of fighters? Thank you, Congressman. Uh, well, certainly uh, these fighters uh, that are able to depart uh, these war zones are able to take with them experiences and uh, tactics that could potentially be uh, be uh, applied to other places. Additionally, they're radicalized, so they have the ability to uh, to bring others on board with this. These are, I think, are the principal concerns. Uh, this has been uh, at the forefront of our efforts from the very beginning. Uh, as you've heard uh, the Secretary talk about our strategy of annihilation in the conduct of our operations, we have always attempted to isolate these areas and prevent the escape of these fighters so that they are either killed or captured uh, where we take them on. And I think we've been successful in that. Not uh, Certainly there are some that, that, have, uh, that have gotten away. We have, uh, uh, with the support of some of the authorities that have been provided to us by Congress, we do have an effective program to interdict foreign fighters as they attempt to depart the area. And we are now working with the Department of State and the Department of Justice uh, to uh, ensure that these hundreds that are in the control of our partners in both Iraq and Syria are uh, moving into a judicial process that holds them accountable and, and ultimately returns them to the countries from which they came. And, and what a challenge that is, the detainees, uh, you're speaking of not just fighters, but um, their uh, families. Uh, and, and this has just got to be addressed, and I, I appreciate you bringing that issue up. Additionally, uh, Turkey has been a valued ally for nearly a century of the United States. A uh, member of NATO, uh, beginning with the Korean War, they've been fighting side by side with Americans for freedom. What is being done to continue our important uh, alliance? Oh, oh, thank you. I, and I would just echo your comments. Turkey has been absolutely vital in, in, in uh, throughout the entire campaign plan. They certainly have uh, serious concerns of PKK terrorism. Uh, of course, this has created some tension with some of the partners that we have on the ground. The principal way that we are addressing this uh, 
uh, Congressman, is by being as transparent and clear and candid with, uh, with Turkey about the things that we are doing on a day-to-day -day basis with our partners. Just this morning, I had a conversation with my counterpart in Turkey, again, sharing information back and forth, keeping the communication channels uh, professional and open uh, as, we, as, we, uh, as we discuss uh, this, this very, very difficult, uh, difficult challenge that we're working through. And, and with the multitude of uh, issues you have to face, Yemen, uh, what's the latest on uh, efforts to uh, provide uh, security and working with uh, Saudi Arabia? I, I would say, you know, our, our, our effort in, in this setting is principally to help them defend themselves. Uh, and I think we have made some very good progress in this area. And I look forward in the close session to sharing with you some examples. We appreciate your service. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Vizi. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I wanted to ask you, there was a uh, column in the Wall Street Journal, I believe in their opinion section, maybe about four days ago, that talked about where they alleged that there was a Russian attack on U.S. Special Operation Forces uh, on the evening of February the 7th and 8th. And I specifically wanted to ask you what you know about that and, and, and how can CITCOM prioritize U.S. counterterrorism objectives while trying to avoid any sort of dangerous escalation with Russia. Uh, thank you, uh, Congressman. I, you know, I think we have uh, kind of characterized that as uh, as pro-regime forces. Uh, we, you know, I'm, we're certainly aware of, of the amount of media that's out there talking about this. Uh, but in this particular instance, this was a very clear case of self-defense on our part, and uh, and so I, I, I frankly am quite proud of the way the force responded to this. Quickly identified it, immediately got on on the on the net with uh, with our Russian uh, through our Russian. Uh, our channel here to to talk with them about this. We're talking with them before, during, and after this, uh, and very effectively brought together the right capabilities to address this this uh, this self defense threat. And so they have uh, continued to do that. So, you know, I, I think what I would just tell you is that we we retain sufficient capability to protect ourselves uh, at the same time that we are pursuing our counterterrorism objectives in in Syria. Do you think that Russia is going to tr want to try to have more influence or diminish our influence in the region once we push ISIS out of there? Or, or how, how do you see that relationship, um, you know, playing out long term? Well, I, I think what, what I would say, Congressman, is, is what, we, what we can see is, is Russia has failed to follow through on delivering the regime in a number of different areas. As we look at the at the UN ceasefire UN sanctioned ceasefire that was put in this place, one that they helped draft uh, and and agreed to uh, to implement and and uh, and to cause the the regime to uh, to comply by it, they have failed to do that. So I, I think either Russia has to admit that it's not capable or it doesn't want to play a role in ending the Syrian conflict here. Uh, I think their role is incredibly destabilizing at this point. Uh, I'd also like to uh, briefly kind of uh, switch here and ask you a, just a little bit of, about Afghanistan, too. I know that there have been some that have been concerned about uh, our deteriorating relationship with the Pakistanis and was wondering how important do you think it is for us to continue to have relationships with Pakistan, keeping routes open so we can uh, adequately supply troops in the Afghanistan uh, part of the Middle East, and and, and just what are some of your, your thoughts on on that whole relationship, and particularly just how it uh, lines up with Afghanistan? Congressman, in my, my view is that success in Afghanistan and in South Asia will require the will require a strong relationship and the cooperation of Pakistan. And and since the announcement of the South Asia strategy, a, this has been one of my principal focuses here is to uh, is to is to help Pakistan uh, and us together achieve uh, the specific things that we require for them, we, we have asked them to do in support of our strategy. And, and what I would report to you and to the committee is that I do have very frequent and routine professional communications with, uh, uh, with my counterpart. We talk almost weekly. We meet frequently face-to-face. -face. Um, and, uh, and I think we are now, and my goal is to develop this very productive and trustful relationship that will help us move forward together. Uh, I, I can't characterize the, the relationship as trustful at this particular point. Uh, there is a lot of history here that has to overcome. But what I would also tell you is that we are now beginning to see 
positive indicators. They, through their communications, their reporting to us, uh, some of the actions that they are taking on the ground, these are positive indicators that they are moving in the right direction. It does not yet equal the decisive action that we would like to see them take in terms of a strategic shift, but they are positive indicators. And it gives me hope that our approach is the right one. I have confidence in our approach and, and, uh, and uh, um, it gives me, gives me hope that we can begin to restore this very important relationship. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. Mr. Lamborn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and General. Thank you for your service. You've barely mentioned Lebanon, and we hardly ever talk about Lebanon, but there are so many problems there, and in any other part of the world, it would be front and center and in the headlines all the time. But with all the other problems in CENTCOM, uh, it takes a back seat. But um, given that Hezbollah is a U.S. designated terrorist organization and that the Lebanese president has been very public in his support of Hezbollah as a military partner with the Lebanese armed forces, and given that we've in the past anyway supplied high quality American arms to the Lebanese armed forces, uh, do you think we should keep working with the Lebanese armed forces and giving them high quality American weaponry and are they a reliable partner? Uh, Congressman, I, I, I think they are a very reliable partner. And I think the investments that we have made over the last 10 or 11 years, uh, very moderate investments in terms of people and money compared to some of the other things we do, have really paid off. And they are uh, helping us develop a very professional uh, Lebanese armed forces that is beginning to be viewed as the principal security arm in uh, in Afghanistan. I, and I, I note your, your comment here about it doesn't appear in the news. But frankly, uh, Lebanon is a, is a frequent stopping place for me and for all of my commanders. And we pay a lot of attention to this relationship. We have an outstanding ambassador there uh, who is very, very engaged in, uh, in the activities. And uh, we're, we're very proud of what the Lebanese armed forces are doing. They very effectively, uh, last, uh, last fall on their own, orchestrated a, orchestrated a pretty effective operation against, uh, against ISIS. But they view us as their most important partner. And I, and I do think it's, it is an investment worth continuing. But doesn't the uh, relationship between uh, uh, the cozying up to Hezbollah within Lebanon uh, to the conventional forces there give you pause? Well, I, 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 I tell you, I frequently interact with the, the chief of defense there. I consider him to be a very professional military officer. Uh, you know, this is a, a multi confessional arrangement here in in Pakistan that that trips obviously trips over into the political environment but what I observe in Lebanon is a military that is uh, that is answerable to the leadership uh, is is doing a good job at staying apolitical and is focused on security of the country okay uh, shifting gears uh, to Saudi Arabia are we doing enough to help them and the United Arab Emirates defend themselves? as was discussed a little earlier, from Iranian-supplied missiles to the Houthi rebels. Are we doing enough? Uh, in this setting, I would say yes, we are. We are, we are definitely focused on this, uh, this particular threat right here, and I look forward to sharing a few more comments with you about this in the closed session. Okay, thank you. Now, in Yemen, uh, the U.S. military has conducted a much higher number of strikes against terrorist targets last year than in 2016, the previous year. What positive impact, if any, have these strikes had on AQAP and on ISIS in Yemen, or excuse me, Islamic State in Yemen? Uh, thank you, uh, Congressman. It has had, a, I think, a very significant impact on on uh, on on, uh, on AQAP. Uh, uh, certainly, it has impacted their ability to conduct external operations. It's gone into the areas in which it, they have had sanctuary, uh, and it has continued to present them with multiple dilemmas that they have to deal with. So, not only are they contending with our strikes, but they're also contending with partner operations uh, that we work with our Arab coalition partners on the ground and with our Yemeni partners on the ground. And this has become very, very effective. And I would tell you that we are extending that to ISIS in Yemen as well. That is not as well developed as, as, uh, as Al-Qaeda is, but of course it is ISIS. We understand their ideology, we understand where they're going, and so we're very concerned about them as well. Okay, thank you. And lastly, um, I'd like to ask about the 4th Infantry Division at Fort Carson in my district. They're sending a, br armored, uh, a brigade combat team to Afghanistan this spring. And even though we've had 
uh, budget shortfalls for the military in recent years. We've made huge steps with this latest budget agreement to beef up military spending, which I totally applaud and support. Um, so I think readiness will be less of an issue in the future, but do you feel good about the current state of readiness with, for instance, the brigade combat team going to Afghanistan uh, this spring? Congressman, I, I do. I haven't had an opportunity to visit that specific brigade, but I've just had an opportunity to visit one of the brigades that's coming in, the Security Force Assistance Brigade. I'm, I'm extraordinarily appreciative of, of the efforts that are put forth by the Army, by the Marine Corps, the Air Force, um, uh, all the services here that we depend upon in Afghanistan to give us high-quality forces. Thank you. Ms. Gabbard. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, General Votel, for your service um, and for being here. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit more about uh, what you began with your opening statement and some of the comments you've made since about U.S. military objectives in Syria. Uh, you talked about how um, you're working to defeat ISIS and bring, the, bring that campaign to responsible close. Uh, later, you mentioned that countering Iran is not a coalition mission in Syria. Uh, last month, we heard from Secretary Tillerson about how U.S. military presence in Syria will remain for an indefinite period of time. And he went on to list a very expansive list of strategic objectives of the U.S. military to include ensuring the defeat of ISIS, to include diminishing the influence of Iran, um, advancing a U.N.-led political resolution, et cetera, et cetera. So my question is, what is the objective of our U.S. forces in Syria, and under what legal basis um, is this indefinite presence in Syria uh, planned under? Thank you. So the, the principal reason we are in, uh, in Syria is to, is to defeat ISIS, and that remains our, our sole and single, uh, single uh, uh, task that we are principally oriented on. Part of defeating ISIS, uh, though, is removing their control of the physical caliphate, the physical terrain, as, as, you're, as you're well aware, and in ensuring they can't they can't resurge. So that means that after we have removed them from uh, their control of the train, we have to consolidate our gains and we have to ensure that the right security and, uh, and stability is in place so that they cannot uh, resurge. So that is, that is part of being uh, responsible coalition members in here, and that, that will take some time uh, beyond, uh, beyond all of this. Uh, our legal basis for operating in uh, Syria is, is, uh, was largely driven by uh, the collective self-defense of Iraq. Uh, when we when we first went there, uh, that uh, ISIS being a uh, being an organization that uh, did not adhere to sovereign boundaries, were moving back and forth across here. And while we were uh, beginning to address ISIS in Iraq, we knew that we also had to uh, address ISIS in uh, in uh, in. Uh, in Syria, I would I would also point out, Congresswoman, that the Syrian regime itself has has proved unwilling and in a, unable to address this particular threat. While they did do some operations down in the middle Euphrates Valley here several months ago, they have largely departed that area, uh, and they have taken the pressure off of ISIS and created more problems for the coalition in dealing with this. So, uh, you know, I, I think those are the principal. Principal. So, so our U.S. forces are still operating under the 2001 AUMF. Is that correct? We we are. And how d does countering Iran? Um, I, I'm I'm just seeing some contradiction between what the Secretary of State is saying that that is now going to be a part of the U.S. military objective in Syria, and what you've stated today, saying that countering Iran is not a part of the coalition mission. Yeah, I, I Congressman. And, and sorry, I just just the follow up to that. How? If it is, then how does that fall under the 2001 AUMF that deals directly with countering al-Qaeda and its affiliates? I think what uh, uh, my understanding, uh, as the Secretary of State laid this out, is he laid it out not as a U.S. military objective, but he laid it out as a U.S. objective. So there are certainly other ways that we can address Iran's destabilizing activities and other through uh, through military uh, military means. Um, the fact of the matter is, I, as I mentioned a few moments ago, even though uh, uh, Iran is not, isn't our principal uh, focus here uh, in this in this in this campaign, our our relationship with partners both in Iraq and in, in, and in Syria 
does put us in a position where we can indirectly uh, have an impact on on the objectives uh, that uh, that Iran is uh, is pursuing in this part of the world. So I, I think I would characterize it more in that regard than uh, us actively doing something militarily against uh, against Iran. Thank you. I, I believe Secretary Tillerson was was quite specific in in speaking about this within the justification of a maintained U.S. military presence there. My last quick question is about Yemen, and under what authorization are we providing arms and direct military support to Saudi Arabia in what is essentially a proxy war between Saudi Arabia and Iran? Well, any, any arms sales, of course, go through our foreign military sales uh, and foreign military funding process that's managed by the Department of State, and so they have, uh, they have the principal oversight for, uh, for that. Um, the provision of fuel uh, to uh, to Saudi aircraft is is provided for under the acquisition cross servicing agreement that we have in place with uh, with Saudi Arabia, and so that provides us the authority to provide that support to them. Mr. Whitman, thank you, Mr. Chairman, General Votel. Thanks so much for joining us today. I wanted to uh, begin by. Uh, getting your perspective, you speak about uh, Navy presence in the Gulf and the Red Sea, and we think about CENTCOM as being land-centric, but we also see, as you specifically point out, uh, the first overseas Navy base put in place by the Chinese in Djibouti. We see in Port Dorlay a single uh, berth there reserved for the Chinese Navy. We see President Xi Jinping, through modernization of his military, looking to very aggressively expand and sustain operations around the world. Uh, from your perspective there as CEMCOM commander in that AR, specifically, what do you see our U.S. Navy doing to counter this Chinese expansionism? And what do you need as far as U.S. Navy presence there to make sure uh, that we have what's necessary there uh, in relation to what we see as, as Chinese uh, aggressive expansion. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Congressman. I appreciate the question. And I would share, and I'm an Army guy saying this, I would share that uh, while we do think about the land territory in, in CENTCOM, it very much is a maritime theater uh, with the three critical choke points that uh, you know, are so important to us in this, in this area. So I do recognize that. Um, I, I would just tell you that I think uh, certainly the resources that are being provided to me, the maritime resources that are provided to me by the Navy and the Marine Corps, I think are adequate to the tasks that we have right now. I think the principal way that we uh, develop resilience against these types of you know, great power influences into this area is through First of all, our presence, our constant presence, and we do maintain a constant presence in both the Red Sea, the uh, the Gulf of Aden, into the, into the Arabian Gulf, and the Gulf of Oman as as well, um, and through our very close partnership with uh, with uh, with uh, with our partners. We we have three combined maritime task forces uh, that are led out of our naval headquarters in in Bahrain that include a variety of different nations. So when I look at the nations that are on our team. Uh, uh, and I look at, uh, at the nations that are lined up with some of these others that are entering in the area, I think our teams are very strong. And I think this is a very key way for us to maintain our influence uh, and pursue our interests in the CENTCOM maritime environment. Very good. Last year, the U.S. Uh, Naval Office of Intelligence um, pointed out some challenges there with potentially placing a mines that would, that would uh, put at risk commercial vessels uh, there near uh, Bab el Mandab Strait. Um, give me your perspective, not only on what that potential threat is, because we see Houthis operating in the area, obviously uh, shooting at U.S. ships. Uh, give me your perspective on what we're doing uh, in mine sweeping op operations there, looking to counter that potential threat from mines, because we know that that's a, a choke point area that's strategically very important. Thank you. Well, we certainly maintain mine sweeping capabilities in the in the Gulf and, and have for a number of years, but so do our partners. Uh, and I would just point out, uh, you know, some of our partners like the Emirates and uh, Saudi Arabia have some very good capability uh, in this regard. And so one of the things that we do is work with them to optimize their capabilities. Again, by 
with and through getting them to use their capabilities and, and using our intelligence and some of our experience to help them be more effective at this. And so this has been, this I think has been very effective in preventing, uh, you know, a major mine catastrophe, if you will, in the, in the Bob El Mandeb. One that we are very concerned about. 60 to 70 ships a day go through the Bob El Mandeb. Not just ours, everybody's. Um, so this is a very real, a very real threat that we have to pay attention to. Do you currently have intelligence gathering operations to look at what's happening in Bob El Mandeb Straits? about the activities that are going on there, what we can do to maybe counter that, or the things we can do to interdict it, because obviously keeping a mine from being laid is a lot better than having to go in and sweep those particular areas, especially from a time perspective. Give us your perspective on what's happening there. Uh, Congressman, I, I would say in this setting we absolutely do, and I would look okay. forward to sharing the details with you in a different setting. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. <coughs> Excuse me, Mr. Carball. Thank you, Mr. Chair. General Votel, thank you for being here today. America has been engaged in Afghanistan for 16 years, and it is difficult to determine what progress we have made. The administration's new strategy increased its troop levels to 14,000 troops. However, unable to learn from history, we are investing more lives and resources without a clearly defined benchmarks. I am extremely concerned about the fact that significant information is being with, withheld from the Office of Inspector General for Afghanistan's reconstruction and ultimately the American people. According to the Inspector General, quote, it is hard to make a determination of how good a job we're doing because if the Afghan military is not doing, not fighting that well, and there are not many of them, we can't determine fraud, waste and abuse in, the, in Afghanistan because they can't get basic facts from the department. How are you measuring progress in Afghanistan? Please describe the end state. What does success look like to you? Currently, what is the amount of territory under the Afghan government control? And help me understand how withholding information has made a difference in our operations in Afghanistan. Uh, thank you, Congressman. Let me take your last one here. Uh, uh, we, we are aware of that issue, and I think measures are being taken to address that right now. Some of that information is not necessarily U.S. government information. It is, it is information of the Afghan government, and so they control the release and classification of that information. So this is something we have to, uh, we have to continue to, to work with. General, um, if, I, if I could just interrupt you. Um, it's great to parlay that to the Afghan government, but we're the ones with resources and the lives of our military there. So it, it, we got to be able to get some information from them to appease those of us that have to make decisions on what kind of investments we need to make in the area. Thank you, Congressman, and, and, and I'm committed to making sure that you do have those details. Um, you asked also about uh, kind of how we're, how, we're, how we're looking at the, at the situation right now. What I would tell you is the big idea here uh, with what we're trying to do in Afghanistan right now is drive towards reconciliation. This is different than an than approach we've had in the past, and we're trying to do that through creating not just military pressure with our military activities on the ground, but we're trying to do it through creating social pressure with things that the Afghan government is doing, like credible elections that they're pursuing this year at the parliamentary level and at the national level next year. And we're doing it through creating diplomatic and regional pressure, uh, just as we talked about with Pakistan a few moments, uh, few moments ago. The idea here is that creating pressure on the, uh, and all those three axes are going are to create enough pressure on the, on the Taliban that they come to the table. What's different this time as we approach this is that we are taking a conditions-based approach that is focused on on reconciliation as its as its end state um, it is a regional focus here and we are engaging the partners in the region not just pakistan but the central asian states as well who are who are key to this and we have changed uh, the way that we are working with the Afghan forces. Um, so we previously had uh, advised down to a very low level with their uh, Afghan special operations forces. Um, <clears throat> we have now, uh, we are now with the additional, with the additional enablers and additional advisors that uh, the department has approved for us are taking that capability and extending it out to their conventional forces. Uh, we are building out the Afghan Air, Air Force. We are building, we are doubling the size of their, of their Afghan special operations capability. So so there are a variety of different uh, aspects to this approach. 
this will give us the ability to, to measure the progress. You asked about how much of the population is controlled by the, uh, by the Afghan government. Today, the figure is 64%. Um, uh, Twelve percent of the population is in areas that are controlled by the uh, by the Taliban, and the balance of that are in contested areas. Our focus, the focus of our military operations, is on increasing and expanding population control by the by the government of Afghanistan. And what we are going to do this season is we are going to again our our intention is to break the stalemate grab the initiative, begin to expand population control in this year and next year, and then ensure that we create a, an environment here that allows for, uh, for uh, credible elections to take place. One of the most important things that the Afghan people need to see from their government. Running out of time, what about information? The sharing of information with the Inspector General. Uh, as, uh, as I mentioned, uh, Congressman, we'll, we will we'll do our very best to ensure that you have the information that you need to make the decisions that, uh, that are necessary. Thank you so much. I yield back, Mr. Chair. Mr. Scott. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. General, uh, thank you for being here. Uh, I want to talk with you a little bit about ISR in the, in the CENTCOM area. And I know you've got a lot of partners in that area, but what, what percentage of the ISR does the United States provide? Um, I, I'm not sure I can tell you what the percentage overall is. I, I mean, it's very clear that the, the, the majority of the ISR in the region is being provided by, uh, by the United States. Um, what about your, the, the DOD's capacity to meet the demand for ISR? Do you have enough ISR currently? Well, I, I think, uh, Congressman, I don't think you're going to find any commander that's going to say that he has enough ISR. Uh, we, we've, we right now today have the largest concentration of MQ-9s down in Kandahar Airfield designed to support General Nicholson and his forces. Uh, and uh, I know he would, uh, and that's adequate to, for what he needs right now, but uh, given, given his own druthers, I'm sure he'd want more. And so we, we would want more in all these areas. Um, I understand that the Army in, in some ways and, and commanders are agnostic as to the different platforms that ISR may come from, but I assume that uh, when it comes to providing additional ISR, the commanders would not be agnostic to the timeline to get new SR to the field. Would that be a, a fair statement? That, that's right. I, I think the, the faster we can continue to provide those capabilities, the better. So w one of my concerns, and I certainly have a tremendous amount of respect for uh, the Secretary of Defense and the, and the Secretary of the Air Force uh, as well. Um, but as they've, as they've changed the strategy to more of a China or a Russia strategy, they are canceling the procurement or have proposed to cancel the procurement of items uh, that are not capable of flying against uh, the Russians or the Chinese in, in a direct conflict with the Russians and the Chinese. Um, one of these platforms is, is the new JSTARS. The, the recapitalization of the JSTARs, which we have spent hundreds of millions to develop and are now currently ready to purchase, and they have proposed to cancel the procurement of the JSTARs um, because they, they've said that they're going to use a system that has not been developed um, yet, which obviously changes the timeline on when we can deliver that system uh, to you. Um, I guess my question is, do, do the systems that you use in Central Command have to be uh, survivable, if you will, in a conflict that would be as high-end as that between the Russians and the Chinese, a direct conflict? Well, they, 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 they don't necessarily need to be. I mean, the, the, the environment is, is different in parts of, parts of CENTCOM than it might be in other parts of the world. So, you know, some of the requirements that I have, uh, the environment that we operate in are probably different than what Admiral Harris and others are, and General Scaparotti, you know, deal with in PACOM and UCOM, respectively, here. Yes, sir. I, uh, I, I would appreciate uh, any advocacy you could have. Um, I agree with you 100 percent, and... and uh, I'm not opposed to the DOD developing the system that they want for the, for the fight against the Russians and the Chinese. But, but even in developing that system, we don't want to use that system unless we have to because we don't want the Russians and the Chinese to be able to gather the intel that they're going to gather from it every, every time we fly it. So uh, certainly continue to be concerned about 
as we shift in strategy to China and Russia, abandoning platforms that work in the other parts of the world, which are very serious fights that we're in and, and that you're commanding um, right now. Um, I'm, I'm down to about a minute, but just briefly, if, if you would, again, I've been on the border of Syria, uh, on the border of Syria in Israel. Um, the military objectives in Syria, can, can you just outline for, for us what they are again, uh, very briefly? Well, uh, specifically, it's to ensure, principally, it's to ensure an enduring defeat of, of ISIS is what the principal uh, objective is of uh, of, uh, of of our military campaign uh, right now in, in Syria. You know, certainly we're concerned about uh, weapons of mass destruction in terms of some of their chemical capabilities, as, as you've seen in the past. We're obviously very concerned about making sure we can provide the, the humanitarian aid, the stability that goes along with getting people back into their homes. We're concerned about uh, making sure that we protect allies that are on the flanks of Syria, Jordan, Lebanon, Turkey, uh, that all feel the impacts of that. And of course, uh, we're, we're very keen to ensure that there's a political, a political resolution to all of this. Of course, that's beyond my military. Sure. General, my time's expired, but it's a, it's a tough situation. I'm glad that we have a leader like you over there, and thank you for your service. Mr. Brown. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, General Votel. Thank you for your leadership and for appearing before the House Armed Services Committee uh, to discuss the uh, uh, readiness, the posture, and the activities uh, within CENTCOM. So thank you. I want to bring your attention back to um, Iran and its activities uh, in Syria, uh, perhaps covering some ground that's been covered uh, and hopefully clarifying at least one point that you made. Uh, Iran is playing a very large role uh, in Syria, providing senior advisors uh, to uh, the Assad regime. Um, delivering weapons, cash, uh, recruiting, and encouraging uh, foreign fighters. Uh, last month, uh, Iran launched a drone uh, that uh, entered uh, Israeli airspace. Uh, there's a series of events resulting in the downing of an F-16. Uh, the situation is clearly escalating uh, and at greater risk. You mentioned, in response to uh, Ms. Cheney's question, that we can impede Tehran. Um, can you just identify what the uh, what those strategic and or operational impediments are that we are putting in Tehran's uh, ter Tehran's way, and can you evaluate the effectiveness of them? Well, I I, I, um, I think some of, uh, as I, as I mentioned, I think one of the things that we can do is we can build strong uh, and resilient partnerships with uh, with our partners, or whether it's the Iraqis on their side of the border, or whether it's uh, you know kind of the Syrian Democratic Force at this point. You know that's our partner on the ground. Um, these. Uh, uh, you know, in many regards, these partners share uh, share the same concerns we do with this, that they don't want their countries, they don't want their areas exploited by others for purposes of creating uh, instability in this in this area. So the, the, the relationships that we develop with them, uh, Iraqi forces, you know, particularly their border control forces, uh, I think help aid uh, and prevent uh, the movement of these types of uh, activities and equipment back and forth across their borders. I think the Iraqis are as concerned about that as, as we would be and as most countries would be. And certainly, uh, I think in Syria, although uh, I, I do acknowledge our, our partners on the ground are a very indigenous partner, they do control very important areas uh, along the border between Iraq and, 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 uh, and Syria. Uh, and so they can as well, uh, through their own operations, uh, make, make, it, make it difficult for, uh, for uh, Iran to pursue their activities through these particular, particular areas. And so that's why I kind of describe it much more in an indirect so, okay, way. As if, if I may, General, so that sounds a little aspirational, uh, and I appreciate that. Can you evaluate the effectiveness of what you just described? How well, I think we're we're working on how on how we how we actually actually do that. I mean, the, mo most of these networks are very resilient. They're very savvy in terms of how they're doing things. Uh, so this is something that we are uh, we are looking at now to how to, how do we how we how we uh, measure the effectiveness uh, effectiveness of it. I mean, we're only in this case largely talking about ground routes, 
certainly uh, Iran has the ability to use air routes as well to, to basically go over, all, go over or around all of that. They have the ability to use maritime routes. They have the ability to go through Africa uh, to get to these areas as well. So, uh, you know, we have to look at this holistically uh, uh, as, we, as we try to try to address this. So let me ask one other question, uh, perhaps the last in the time I have remaining. Um, I understand that Israel is in the UCOM AOR, but I, you know, conflict in that region doesn't necessarily respect uh, the uh, uh, area of operations of our different commands. Can you talk about, in the event, regardless of the likelihood of a conflict between Iran uh, and Israel, regardless of how it's provoked, can you just comment on uh, what our readiness in, in, this, in, in this setting, perhaps it's best for the classified setting, our readiness and posture uh, to uh, come to the aid of Israel. Um, I, again, I think that's that's probably a, a question that's best uh, suited for uh, for General Scaparati. But what I would tell you the readiness and posture for th that wouldn't involve uh, right. I, given that he is he is the, he is it is in his area and he has a principal responsibility for that relationship. What I would tell you is this: is that you know the the CENTCOM area, not just on on the. Uh, on the Israeli border, but certainly on the border of Egypt with Libya, on the border of Pakistan with India, to the north of the Central Asian states with Russia, we have, it's a tough neighborhood. And so it is imperative for the combatant commanders to be very well nested across all of these areas. And, and I think under the leadership of our chairman and with the national defense strategy that the secretary has put in place, that we are uh, improving significantly our ability to operate uh, in cooperation with each other, and in many cases, very, very seamlessly. So it's it's not unusual for General Scaparotti and I to have a, a lot of coordination and talking uh, across across our common common areas of concern. Just like it's not uncommon for General Waldhauser and Africom and I not to talk, or General or Admiral Harris and I to talk about the things on on his side. So this is an area where we have really got to continue to pay attention to, and, I, and I'm and I'm and I think we're doing a a, a much much better job of this. Thank you, General. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. McSally. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. General Vitale, good to see you again. Uh, I have three important questions. I'll be as fast as I can. Uh, the first is about this uh, attack on U.S. forces in Syria. Uh, media reports uh, alleging it's by Russian mercenaries. Uh, can you comment at all if we have confirmation that, in fact, uh, those were Russian mercenaries, number one? Uh, how many you think were killed? And do we have any confirmation that that was approved or uh, ordered by the Kremlin or Putin? And what do you think their objective might have been? Congresswoman, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure I can report anything different than you have seen in the, in the media and in the press on this right now in terms of numbers and, and uh, attribution of who this, uh, who this is. In, in, uh, I, what I can tell you is that throughout this entire event, we were in communications on our communication channel with the Russians before, during, after. Uh, and what they told us is these were not their forces and not, not their military forces. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, I, I think the, that kind of speaks for itself self here uh, in terms of what, uh, what they are. And then, of course, we've seen all the media that has come out after this. So uh, to me, it highlights, uh, again, the unwillingness, inability of the regime and pro-regime forces to take seriously the ISIS threat, particularly if there's apparent uh, uh, contracted forces in, in the area attempting to do this. So do you, do you believe there were not Russian uh, mercenaries? And do we have any intelligence to corroborate or confirm or deny that? None that I would discuss in this particular setting. Okay, but could we maybe discuss in the follow-on setting? I'd be happy to okay. talk with you. Uh, but, but do you personally believe that they were not Russian mercenaries at this point, or can you not even say that? I, I would, uh, we have characterized them as pro-regime forces at this point. Okay, I look forward to following up in the classified setting. Uh, second topic is uh, A-10 Warthog was back in Afghanistan, uh, kicking butt uh, in January. Can you comment on uh, the types of missions that they're doing? And I know it's a little specific, but as part of the shift in strategy, it seems like we're now going after more of the sources of revenue, um, perhaps overall, uh, and attacking the uh, you know poppy industry and the drug making uh, 
uh, facilities, <clears throat> and uh, how is the A-10 doing over there? The A-10s are doing industry? great. They were in action within 24 hours of being on the ground here, and I've had an opportunity to visit the squadron and meet the squadron commander, and really very proud of, of what they're doing. And they are doing the things that we would expect the A-10s to do. Uh, part of our concept and why we're pushing advisor teams down to a lower level is so that we can bring capabilities like the A-10 to bear very effectively in support of the Afghan uh, National Defense Forces, and so the, I, that's what we expect they're doing. You are correct. Uh, one of the things that has been successful and we've c tried to carry over from our, our defeat ISIS campaign is going after the revenue generation. And in this case, the narco trafficking that is fuels the Taliban. And so uh, this, is a, this is a key focus for General Nicholson and our forces at this point. Great, thanks. Uh, I do want to note if the last administration got their way, all the A-10s would be in the boneyard by now. And uh, as I told this president, uh, you're going to have to pry them out of my cold, dead hands uh, because it's such a critical war fighting capability. And I appreciate this committee and the leadership working to keep that asset so we can do be, mission, be doing missions like this. Uh, last topic is I'm really concerned about um, the buildup on um, Israel's northern border, so southern Syria, of Iranian-backed uh, militias and forces, uh, Quds Force uh, commanding that, uh, and the increased uh, aggression we're seeing from there. Um, as uh, uh, the Assad regime ke seems to be shoring up, uh, controlling that area, and uh, the potential for escalation of a crisis uh, with Israel. Again, I know that you comes AOR, but Syria is yours. So can you speak to what you're seeing in the trends in the Golan areas and, and whether there's a threat there? I, I think we share the share the same concerns that you've just uh, just highlighted right here. And uh, you know what this is, uh, you know, very effectively in this uh, in this uh, south western corner of uh, of, uh, of Syria, we've uh, been able to diplomatically begin to address that. And so, uh, working with uh, the the special presidential envoy, Mr. McGurk, and others, we're continuing to keep focus on that. Again, uh, Russia is a party to this, and they have responsibilities to ensure that the uh, that the you know, the detractable partners that uh, that may be in this area are under control. And so they have to take responsibility for this and be held uh, accountable, not just the Iranians, but the others that are down there uh, that are uh, that are much more akin to uh, the violent extremists down there. So I think we have to continue to address that in this in this particular. In Can this you particular share area. any of the trends that you're seeing uh, increase in military capability? We've seen again with uh, escalation over the last few weeks and, and any concerns you have about that escalating into a full blown crisis with Israel. Well, I think what I'm what I'm concerned about is in, in in these places down in the down in the southwest, and particularly up in places like Idlib, these are becoming collection zones for a lot of uh, a lot of uh, uh, unsavory organizations right here, and eventually they're going to have to be dealt with. And so I am concerned that uh, that uh, left unaddressed, uh, uh, that they will become bigger problems. Uh, in terms of trends and stuff like this, I can't tell you in the southwest, particularly in this setting, that we've seen anything specific specific here in terms of this, but obviously there's some concerns. But what we have seen in places like Idlib and others is where these groups that have come together are, are, are do potentially uh, uh, pose long-term challenges for security of the region above and beyond Syria. Great, thanks. I'm over my time, but I look forward to discussing further in the closed session. Thanks. Mr. Langevin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, General, uh, great to see you again. Thank you for your great service to the nation. It's a Pleasure to have you back before the committee once again. Uh, I'd like to continue on the uh, the Iran uh, topic as well, uh, and deep uh, do a little uh, deeper dive as, uh, on this topic. So, uh, Iran supports numerous uh, proxies: uh, Hezbollah in, in, in Israel, Lebanon, and Syria, uh, the Houthis in uh, in Yemen, and militias in uh, in Iraq. Uh, Iran is using its militias and insurgents abroad to uh, upset the existing order and sow chaos, obviously, and uh, in addition to proxies, Iran uses other uh, asymmetric means like cyber uh, operations and information warfare to expand uh, its influence in the region. So can you explain how um, uh, you've seen Iran utilize these techniques during your tenure as CENTCOM commander uh, to create a land bridge through Iraq and Syria to Lebanon, uh, and if you think they've been uh, effective in increasing their influence through this strategy? Thanks, uh, thanks, Congressman. Some of some of this discussion probably I think is best set for a for a uh, closed session here. But you know, I, I think uh, you know what 
what, uh, what Iran attempts to do is by creating proxy organizations that can go out there and do their bidding, that can operate in areas in which they have interests, I think they are attempting to do that. And I do think we see some instances uh, of that as we look at some of the undisciplined uh, Shia militia organizations that are here that are much more beholden to Iran than they are to, say, the government of Iraq. Uh, this, is, this is very concerning to us. And I think this gives us indications that they are acting not on behalf of the government they uh, they say they're representing, but on behalf of another party. Okay, good. I look forward to Thank following you. up on that question too. Once we're in the closed session, um, so the uh, the the war in Syria has left uh, hundreds of thousands uh, dead, millions either uh, uh, internally displaced or seeking asylum as uh, as refugees. But as the uh, the fight against ISIL uh, transitions to consolidating gains and building. Stability. It, it seems as if some of the groups uh, that uh, that have formed partnerships of convenience may now turn their attention towards fighting each other uh, instead. So, how do you see these various elements aligning themselves uh, in Syria? And you worry about a potential shifting regional balance of power? And you feel uh, the Syrian Kurds might uh, feel slighted by recent events and align more closely with Iran to ward off threats? Um, yeah, so first off, Congressman, what I would say is with the partners that we operate, the Syrian Democratic Forces, we have not necessarily seen what you're uh, infighting among themselves here in terms of that. I mean, it is it is a large organization, roughly half Kurd, half uh, Arab, um, and with some others uh, thrown in there, Yazidis and others, Turkmen that are involved in this group. But frankly, they have, uh, uh, in my estimation, have continued to uh, be pretty coherent in terms of how they are they are doing this. Uh, I, I guess the way I would describe it is that as as we are competing, as we are completing the defeat of ISIS, I think what we are now beginning to see is the, the reemergence of many of the underlying issues that have always been in place in Syria. And as we have converging forces in the area, we are now seeing diverging interests. Uh, and uh, I think we see this down in the middle Euphrates Valley uh, between the focus of the coalition and our partners on the ground and what the pro-regime element is, is focused on. Um, they are less concerned about rooting out uh, ISIS than they are about uh, going and addressing some of the opposition elements to the, to the regime. So I, I, think what we, I think what we have to be mindful of is that as we, as we, as the caliphate goes away and as the threat of, of ISIS uh, is removed, we will begin to see more of a return to the underlying challenges that, that really gave birth to many of these, uh, many of these uh, to this problem and other problems in the country. And th those are ultimately going to have to be addressed through a, some type of Geneva process that brings the parties together to uh, you know, establish some kind of process uh, and uh, an arrangement that, uh, that allows uh, Sir, uh, Syria to be the country that, uh, that it should be. Yeah, it seems that we're right at more of that, that tipping point right now where State Department has to play a stronger role in, uh, in working with the, 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 the powers uh, that have interest there and, and try to bring about a, a political solution. So uh, I hope we're going to be pursuing that on, on dual tracks. Um, I, I see my, my time's left, uh, it's about to run out. So. Uh, I'll hold my questions for the, uh, uh, the the closed session. But again, thank you for your uh, your service, General, and uh, I'll yield back. Mr. Russell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, General Votel, for your uh, testimony today. Uh, a couple of areas that uh, I've not uh, heard discussed, but uh, could you give us your thoughts on Turkish operations in Efren uh, and its partnering with al-Qaeda affiliates, its attacks on U.S. backed forces, and how that will impact the by, with, and through strategy to make a stable border security force. Uh, Congressman, I, th I think some of that would probably be reserved for a, for a closed session here. But, uh, you know, I, I, I think we have acknowledged that Turkey has some concerns along their, has some significant concerns along their border with longstanding PKK interests. Um, uh, our, our concern, of course, is that this, this activity in Afrin is, is detracting from, from our efforts against ISIS. And then uh, kind of a broader scope on that, uh, what actions do you think are needed to prevent this mixture of Erdogan-Putin counter efforts to secure the hard-fought gains against ISIS? 
Well, I think as I mentioned in my opening statement, as I've said a couple times here, I, I, I really view Russia as being at the at the heart of many of these issues here, and uh, and I'm being very serious when I say they play the role of both arsonists and firemen, uh, fueling tensions and then trying to resolve them in their favor, uh, and manipulating all all the parties they can uh, to try to achieve their uh, to achieve their objectives, their objectives, and not necessarily the the broader objectives of the international community here. So I, I think there certainly has to be more uh, accountability and pressure put on Russia to do what they said they were going to do. Um, do you think that that uh, pressure um, could come from the other instruments of national power from the United States on our NATO ally uh, in Turkey? I, I think they, sh they can come from a variety of different, different sources, Congressman. And then I guess, uh, can, can you speak also uh, to the need to interdict the ISIS-Al-Qaeda uh, migration into sub-Saharan Africa, uh, AQ, uh, uh, Maghreb, Boko Haram, others uh, see a lot of that now that as they've been pushed out of one area that they may drift over to the other and how that would cooperate between uh, the combatant commands. Well, certainly we're we're, uh, we're very cognizant of what uh, Africom is dealing with with their partners on the ground in the in the Sahel and the Maghreb here, and, and very very concerned about that. I think one of the principal things that uh, that we can do is continue to share information back and forth. Frankly, we're we're not seeing mass migration of these fighters. I, I won't tell you that they're probably not getting out with refugees and others that are that are doing that. That probably is occurring, uh, but uh, certainly this is a this is a this is a concern long term and so I think one of the things that we are attempting to do is uh, particularly now that we have so many foreign fighters that have been captured and are in some level of detention with our partners here is try to get the, the international community engaged in taking responsibility for their people and, and bringing them to uh, some level of justice. There's a lot that can be learned from these uh, foreign fighters and we have to make sure that we've exploited that and learned as much as we can so we can prevent it but we also need to make sure that they're, they're put back into the judicial process so they can be dealt with by their countries from which they came. And then uh, I guess the last question I have would be, uh, could, could you give your assessment of uh, Egyptian and Saudi uh, combined efforts uh, on Yemen and the status of Yemen? On... Uh, on, with respect to the status of, of Yemen, uh, I, I think I, I obviously the uh, Yemen is is, uh, is 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 very destabilized at this particular point. Not only do they have a civil war going on, they have uh, kind of a proxy war playing out here between Iran and Saudi Arabia, uh, with Iran introducing advanced technology into there. We uh, we see uh, Houth the enabled Houthis trying to challenge uh, navigation in the uh, in the uh, Bab el Mandeb, and of course they have a counterterrorism. Terrorism uh, problem that uh, that we are very uh, focused on. So you know, uh, I, I think from the counterterrorism standpoint, I think we are making very good progress in this particular area. Uh, I I I I, uh, I, uh, I don't see uh, uh, significant changes in the civil conflict that's taking place. That's largely being orchestrated uh, by the Arab coalition that's on the ground there. They uh, certainly need to put some more effort into that. Uh, uh, we're paying attention to the efforts uh, by our diplomats and others here to try to address this politically. Uh, there have been there has been some opportunities in the past that have not come to fruition yet, and there I think there still has to we still have to continue on this area. But I, I think Yemen is an area that we should all be concerned about because we're seeing all kinds of problems in that in that particular area and on top of it huge humanitarian issues the people are suffering greatly all right, thank you and thank you mr. chairman Ms. Rosen thank you I want to thank the general for being here today thank the ranking member and the chairman for this important hearing I'd like to speak a little bit about sanctions on um, Iran and Russia. And what's your opinion in how would implementing sanctions, or what level of sanctions, if any, do you think would uh, uh, influence activities in the Middle East, specifically Russia and Iran? Uh, well, um Congresswoman, you, you, we don't really uh, manage those within the Department of Defense, and certainly not within uh, within CENTCOM. I do know that the uh, the Secretary has has recently provided some information to the 
uh, to Senator Corker and others on uh, with regards to CATSA and some of the other things uh, regarding uh, regarding sanctions out here, and uh, and I, I think th those kind of represent his, his interests. Um, you know, I uh, I think sanctions are a very important part of this. In most of these most of these threats, and I think as I tried to mention in my opening comments, these are this is a team sport. And so we can do things militarily, but we also need the other instruments of our national power, whether it's diplomatic, whether it's economic, whether it's informational, to really kick in on these, on these things. And, and, in, and when we are able to bring all of those together to include things like sanctions, I think we often have the best effects. And so, you know, I, I think there are certainly, uh, certainly some very good areas where sanctions will make a, will make a difference. We do, have to, uh, we do have to look at the impact of those on some of our partners. We have to be mindful of that. Uh, I, I do think granting waiver authority to the Secretary of State uh, with regard to some of these things is a good is a good approach and gives us the the flexibility that we need in these regards. Uh, but uh, I, you know, I, I look at it as as a key part of the whole of government approach. So you feel you're getting enough support in this regard? I I, I do, and uh, and I and I and I certainly know this is a continuing area of topic in other parts of the government. Thank you. I also want to switch over and talk about Syria a little bit. And so uh, where does the communication stand after Russian-aligned troops, of course, attacked our partner forces in Syria uh, in early February? So uh, how are things going there and our strategy of deconfliction with Russian uh, mechanisms? Uh, has that been helpful? Congresswoman, there's been no change in, in the communication channel that we have had. Our deconfliction channel remains very professional military discussion. It was before. Uh, and it has been since, and so it remains an effective way to deconflict our forces and make sure our airmen stay safe and our people on the ground are safe. Thank you. I yield back my time. Mr. Gallagher. Just to follow up briefly on something Mr. Russell said, what do we say to our uh, NATO allies in Ankara regarding our support for Kurdish elements in Syria, the YPG and other elements? What message do we communicate to them? Uh, the, uh, the message that, uh, that, that I have conveyed is that uh, our, Kurdish, our Kurdish partners, part of, the, part of the Syrian Democratic Forces, a multi-ethnic force that uh, consists in equal measures and actually in greater measures of Arabs than, than Kurds, uh, has been the most effective force on the ground in Syria against ISIS. And we need them to finish this to finish this fight. Um, so I, I think that's the the first thing, and really one of the principal things we have to acknowledge to them. Uh, I think we also have to acknowledge their concerns about this, and uh, and so uh, our attempts to try to be as transparent and clear in terms of what we are doing and our way forward. I think there are things we have to continue to emphasize to them. And do they simply make no distinction between the PKK and the elements that we support on the ground in Syria? Well, they, they don't draw that distinction. Yeah. And, uh, of course, that's the, that's the tension. Um, to follow up on something Ms. Cheney said earlier, mm -hmm. or that in res you said in response to her question, that we, it is not part of the coalition effort to counter Iran in Syria. How would you characterize our strategy in Syria vis-a-vis -vis Iran? What are we trying to do to Iran in Syria? Well, I, I, think, I think our, our broad... U.S. government objective here is to uh, is to limit uh, Iran's influence in 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 Syria, uh, because as 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 we've as we've seen, they are they are attempting to uh, to arm and uh, and motivate fighters that could pose threats to our other our other uh, vital partners here, uh, and so you know I think as a I think as a government we have we have interests in trying to limit limit their, uh, their influence and activities in, in this part of the region. And I, I don't want to spend my remaining time on a semantic debate, but I, I just would say if, they're, if their uh, influence is gaining in Syria and we need to limit that, um, I sort of think that necessarily involves us countering uh, their gains in Syria. So perhaps some clarity. Or let me rather say, what, what, is, our, what is our strategy, how would you characterize our strategy vis-a-vis -vis Iran throughout the rest of the region? I would I would characterize our strategy as uh, as uh, deter, assure, 
and compete. Uh, we have to have capabilities in place to deter Iran's uh, use of ballistic missile capability against our partners, and we have to ensure that we can deter their ability to race to a nuclear weapons yeah. uh, capability. We have to always assure our partners in the, in the region. Uh, as as I, I think I've said several times here, our partnerships, when you line up our coalition versus their coalition, ours is much more capable. And so continuing to develop those relationships uh, is really, really important in assuring our partners that we're going to be there with them. And then we have to compete with them, not just militarily, but with our other instruments of power in the areas that we can. Uh, and, uh, and this is pushing back, rolling back on their influence, pushing back on their narrative uh, where we can, and then in the areas where we must, uh, preventing them from moving uh, their weapons and other things around the theater that pose threats to to our partners. But does that roll back, that competition sort of reach a, a limit in Syria? Is there is there some reason we're being less a, aggressive there? I mean, you sort of mentioned Iraq as an area where we're competing more effectively with them. Well, I, 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 I think my point is only that as, as we form the coalition, the Defeat ISIS coalition mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, has both a military and a political component to it, that uh, one of the objectives that, that has not been assigned to us is countering Iran. Mm -hmm. It has specifically been focused on the ISIS mission. So I, I think that's what I'm trying to emphasize. And then in Iraq, um, do you think we're actively uh, or effectively uh, competing with them? And, and I'm thinking specifically of, you know, one of the biggest phenomena in the last year has been the rise of the PMF and you know some of these groups may be able to be incorporated in the ISF but others are terrorists you know taking orders from the IRGC. <clears throat> so, yeah. Well I think uh, you know certainly addressing the uh, the PMF is something that the Prime Minister will will have to do and, and in many regards he has done that but again I think one of the one of the one of the best things we can do on the ground in Syria is being a really good and valued partner to the to the Iraqi security forces. And I think the assistance that the United States and the coalition did, I think, demonstrated that. And in my engagements with uh, the security force leaders that I talk to on a regular basis, uh, I think they deeply value that and they appreciate it. Uh, and they look forward to maintaining that relationship in the future. I've run out of time. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Mr. Swazi. General, I want to thank you so much for your service and the, the great work of, of everyone under your command uh, throughout the regions uh, that are under your, your command. Uh, I, my particular concerns are about Afghanistan that I briefly discussed with you before the hearing began. And uh, the Special Inspector General's uh, report on Afghan reconstruction reports that we're not making progress uh, as far as population centers and how much we control. In fact, we lost a little bit of, a little bit of ground uh, from the last report. And I support uh, what the military is doing. I supported the effort to increase the number of troops recently, and uh, uh, I think that you have a very clear strategy as far as the five points of helping the Afghan army, helping uh, the Afghan special forces to increase their size and effectiveness, increase the uh, uh, collaboration between the Afghan Air Force and the army, as well as uh, uh, replace their platforms with American equipment as opposed to Russian equipment. Uh, help the police, uh, and put more pressure on Pakistan. It's a clear five-point strategy that makes tremendous sense, and you're doing a very effective job of, of clearing and holding area. The problem is the backfilling. And in your uh, prepared testimony, you talked about how uh, Kabul's uncertain political situation remains the greatest risk of stability. And you went on to say that uh, the government of the Islamic uh, Republic of Afghanistan continues to suffer from a professional governmental capacity deficit, competing interests, and corruption. And my concern is that your colleagues on the civilian side do not have a clear plan the way that the military has. So I want to ask you, who do you see as being your clearest partners with General Nicholson on the civilian side in this effort? And what do you perceive their strategy to be, if you could put it in a succinct way? Because I don't see them putting out a clear, succinct plan on the civilian side. So you're clearing and holding, but when it comes to rebuilding and transitioning, they're not laying out a clear plan. So I just want to ask you to comment on that, please, General. Uh, thank you, I, Congressman. I, I think that the principal partner that we would look to on the U.S. side certainly is the is the ambassador and the country team. And uh, I, you know, I I, uh, I do think we have a very outstanding ambassador on the ground. I think he is very engaged in this, uh, and I think we are uh, beginning to address uh, address many of these things that you have talked about. As I mentioned to you, in many regards, the military uh, missions in many of these countries 
really are the easy part of addressing the, uh, addressing the situation. And the more difficult part is the political resolution that has to take place afterwards, because this is when you have to address the deep underlying issues that you know, oftentimes gave way to the conflict that we just, that we just, just resolved. Uh, I, as, as, as I think I mentioned to you beforehand, you know, tomorrow in Kabul, the, uh, the pres President Ghani, and you know, with, certainly with the support of our embassy, will be hosting the Kabul Process Conference that will address both reconciliation and, and counterterrorism, and it will be an opportunity with 25 nations brought in to help uh, do that. There, there are efforts underway uh, with, uh, with our uh, Department of State interlocutors to help uh, devise, uh, devise ways to move forward with reconciliation. Uh, it, is, it is extraordinarily complex. The, the Taliban is not a singular, contiguous group to deal with. It is broken, it is fractured, uh, and, uh, and so not only do we have to look at reconciliation, we have to look at things like reintegration uh, as well. So, uh, you know, the, the task in front of our diplomats to solve this, I think, is an extraordinarily complex one as they move forward. And, uh, and, and I do think uh, it there certainly is a challenge here, uh, but I do think that they are, uh, they are, uh, they are moving forward in, in ways to, to begin to address this uh, effectively here as we apply military, social, and, and diplomatic pressure to, to bring the Taliban to the table. So, General, in your testimony, you also, thank you very much for that, by the way. In your testimony, you talked about how Pakistan is starting to share more information <clears throat> and collaborate more than they had uh, historically. What, what do you, what's your prognosis with, with Pakistan? What do you see happening uh, in real time other than the sharing of information? And what can we hope to expect as far as uh, progress regarding the governing of the ungoverned areas? Well, uh, you know, uh, I, I would say that, uh, first off, I think it's important to recognize that Pakistan is actually, you know, Pakistan as a country has suffered greatly from the uh, from terrorism, uh, perhaps as much as anybody in the region, and maybe as many as much as anybody around the world, uh, and they have taken a number of measures to uh, to address terrorism within their uh, within their uh, borders, and that has that has contributed uh, over the years to to uh, to uh, in, you know in, in some increased uh, security in the area, uh, but uh, um, and and we have to recognize that up front. So our, our approach, I think, is to continue to. To be engaged with them. We want to have a we want to have a candid discussion. I think I, I do. We want to have frequent communication. We want to build trust in this relationship. Uh, the history of the United States and Pakistan is a very long. Uh, history here, uh, we do share many interests, and uh, and uh, and they share many things in common with us culturally, militarily, politically, uh, in terms of what we're doing. But we have to continue to work with them to move them in directions that cause them to make strategic changes uh, in their approach, and that's that's really what we're aimed at. I don't know that we can put a time limit on that, uh, but I, as I mentioned to you, we are seeing. Uh, some positive indicators, and we have to ensure that we don't overlook these as we as we move forward, and we continue to build on these. And this is what my my objective is with my with my counterparts. Thank you, General. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gates. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, General, for your service and for being here. There is no place in the world where Iranian-backed proxy forces are a stabilizing feature of the terrain. Is there? I, not that I would, I would not characterize it that way, Congressman. So in July of 2015, we have the birth of the JCPOA. From that point in time until today, would we say that Iran has made the same investment in their proxy forces, a reduced investment in their proxy forces, or an enhanced investment in their proxy forces? Uh, I, I think I would characterize it as an enhanced investment in, in their proxies and partners. So. Since the JCPOA, we've got Iran putting more money behind proxy forces that are destabilizing in literally 100 percent of the circumstances in which they exist. In August of 2017, the Iranian parliament votes to increase their military spending. Are there particular capabilities that we think may emerge from that, particular tactics that Iran is investing in as they, make a, as they use more of the cash that they now have access to um, to be a destabilizing hegemon? Well, Congressman, I, I mean, I, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, I think as we look at the Iranian threat, I think what we've seen is not only an increased 
quantitatively, but in some cases <laughs> an increase qualitatively in some of the capabilities that they have uh, they have developed. They are using the opportunity of things like uh, Yemen to uh, you know like we think we go out to uh, China Lake to test our weapon systems. They go to Yemen to test their weapon systems. So they're they're taking advantage of these opportunities to improve their capabilities uh, around the world. So I I I, I, I definitely am concerned about this. You also test some great weapon systems in, off my district in northwest Florida we're very proud of. Uh, my district's also home to the 7th Special Forces Group. They do a great deal of work in the CENTCOM AOR and frequently they return home and then deploy to SOUTHCOM AOR to find themselves fighting a very similarly flavored enemy in radical um, Islamic extremists funded in many circumstances by Iran through their terror proxies. Are there areas within CENTCOM's AOR where there are training activities, where recruits are being brought in from other parts of the world, particularly the Western Hemisphere, and then essentially redeployed after receiving training in the CENTCOM AOR? Uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure I can answer that in this particular setting here. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that there, there probably are. Okay. Well, we may chat about that a little later today then. Are there particular capabilities in the development of Iran's terror proxies that we find them particularly investing in, whether that's drone technology, whether that's guerrilla capability, uh, the development of explosives. Uh, yeah, I think all of the above. Um, I, I think these are all tactics that we've seen in the past. You know, certainly we're concerned about the, the increasing use of missiles of all short-range, medium-range missiles, uh, and that type of stuff is very concerning. Uh, their, their use of, uh, of uh, UASs is a particular concerning emerging uh, threat for us here uh, that, we're, uh, that we're concerned about. But I think, what, you know, the other things is that, uh, you know, uh, I think if we look at what uh, Iran did in, what it took Iran to do in, it took 20 years for Iran to do in Lebanon with the Lebanese Hezbollah. They're attempting to do in about five years with the Houthis in Yemen. This, this is very concerning to us. So uh, I think they're accelerating their pace and their ability to do this. And, and this is something we have to, have to be very concerned about. Uh, I completely agree. And I, I would add to the list uh, activities in the Western Hemisphere where that very same game plan that we've seen Iran run in Syria, then on the Arabian Peninsula, and now in our own backyard, would, would continue that troubling trend line with an increase both in volume and in quality. Uh, as we look at the particular missile systems that you mentioned and the areas where they may be used, I, I look particularly to our ally Israel as a, as a point of vulnerability. Um, do we see the Iranian, or in what capacity do we see the Iranians hardening their positions in southern Syria? And uh, what feedback have we gotten at the mill-to-mill -mill level from our ally Israel about their discomfort with that? In this setting, I would just say I think we've seen, uh, and, and we've seen in public uh, public media releases here. You know, uh, uh, I, Israel has has struck at some of these locations here uh, that uh, that they have posed 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 a threat to them. Um, so, you know, I think in this setting, I think I would leave it at that. That uh, there certainly is certainly are some concerns there. Great. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I look forward to our next setting. I yield back. Mr. Gallego. Thank you, General. Uh, we recently heard from Admiral Harris that munitions have been a great concern for him in PACCOM. Uh, CENTCOM has obviously been using a lot of munitions in the counter-ISIL fight. So please describe for me the state of our current munitions in, uh, in CENTCOM, and are you getting what you currently need? Uh, Congressman, we, we are, and and uh, I, I'd be happy to take it for record and give you some more detail on this. But what we did in CENTCOM here over the last, uh, with the support of the department, was uh, put in controlled supply rates uh, for our key munitions here, and we've been managing that for some time. Uh, certainly, the the success that we've had in Iraq and Syria uh, has resulted in a in a lower use of that, which has allowed us to cross level within the theater to Afghanistan to address our issues. Um, uh, I, I, I won't comment on the broader uh, department-wide uh, challenge with this, but I think we are being well-supported right now in CENTCOM. Okay, so follow up a little on that then. Um, from what I understand, are the other commands, especially UCOM, are they keeping their stocks at the appropriate levels they need, anticipating the kind of adversaries? Congressman, I, th I think that's probably a better question for them. Okay. I, I can't comment on their stockages. So, okay, switching gears then. Would you call Qatar a dependable partner? 
I think Qatar has been a dependable partner to us. Certainly, we have our, uh, you know, my forward headquarters is located in Qatar. Our air, we have our air operations center there. Uh, I think they've been good partners to us in the past. Is the discord between our GCC other partners outside of Qatar, uh, and especially between uh, Saudi and Qatar, especially in, in regards to the bloc, um, has that affected any of our operations in SECOM? It has not had a significant impact on our military activities, and we've, uh, we've made this very clear from the beginning that we would not allow that, and I think we've largely been successful in mitigating most of that. Excellent. Thank you. I yield back. Mr. Banks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and General. Thank you for being here today. Um, can we go back to Afghanistan for a moment, and could you comment more specifically on how, how tenuous is our 39 member nation coalition? Is it continuing to weaken, uh, or do you have a more of, a, more of an optimistic outlook on where our coalition is heading forward? I, I think our coalition remains very, very strong in, in Afghanistan. You know, the uh, one of the things that underpins uh, uh, the, uh, the, you know, the Afghan the president's uh, roadmap for the Afghan National Defense Security Forces was the commitment made by the NATO nations, the partner nations, and the Brussels Conference and in Warsaw to make sure that, uh, that we, they, we, they, we, the support would be continued. And so we have seen the partner nations continue to sustain, and in many cases, Cases, increase the, their contributions to the to the effort. So just to repeat, so we're seeing it. We're seeing in some places an increase. Can you mention which which nations are increasing their commitment? Uh, I think the UK is uh, is an example of where they've increased uh, some of their uh, recent uh, recent contributions. Okay, thank you. A moment ago, you said um, in addressing Mr. Swazi's comments that Pakistan has paid a significant price. Um, have, has suffered greatly, was your quote. Um, in your testimony, though, you quote, say, the Taliban and Haqqani leadership and fighters continue to find sanctuary in Pakistan, end quote. And then on the next page, you, you talk about our discontinuing of IMET, FMF uh, support to Pakistan. Um, can, you, can you dig a little bit deeper into that? I mean, what, what, what is working to bring uh, Pakistan back to the table to uh, to thwart the Taliban and, and other like-minded groups in providing them sanctuary in Pakistan. Well, I, you know, I think uh, certainly the the, the pressure that uh, that our our government put on Pakistan as we as we brought out the strategy, I think, contributed to that. Uh, I think what is also working right now is the approach that we have in place with them. Uh, I think we have tried to be very clear in terms of the things that we needed them, we need Pakistan to do for us. Uh, and what I have endeavored to do, not always in a public way, uh, but in a private way, is develop a relationship that allows us to uh, to, to uh, provide feedback both ways. There are things, frankly, that Pakistan has asked of us as well. So we are, this is a two-way two-way street here. And so it's my responsibility, I think, to make sure that we have feedback loops in place that go back and forth between the things that we are doing to try to uh, try to support each other, and uh, and uh, and uh, and moving forward in that regard. And so, I, you know, I'd be happy to talk a little bit more about this, uh, perhaps in a closed session here. But that really was this is about is about building building uh, a bridge back, building the trust that you know, has to underpin this relationship that has been missing from from it for a long time. Has there been a plan to to recontinue FMF and IMAT support to pa Pakistan? I I. I I don't think we have we have addressed that at this particular point. So we, we remain um, in a posture of, of discontinuing that support. That's, Pakistan is that's the current been, posture, and I would imagine hopefully in the future we'll have an opportunity to reconsider. Has that been a bit beneficial? Uh, well, again, I think it's created some of the some of the pressure on this in many regards. Uh, you know, Pakistan isn't necessarily looking for our equipment in all these cases. They are looking for our understanding and respect in terms of what the, what they've accomplished here. So again, this is uh, really about relationship building, and that's that's principally my focus here with with uh, with my counterpart. Uh, Pakistan continues to provide a very important and strategic logistical route uh, for our efforts into Afghanistan. Have you seen those, those um, logistical routes continue to operate uh, fully as they've had I have. for the past decade I have. plus? The ground lines communication, airlines communication is absolutely vital to us, and they have continued to sustain that. Okay. Thank you very much. I yield back. Thank you. Mr. O'Rourke. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, General, could you 
tell us how many U.S. forces we have in Afghanistan right now? How many service members are uh, deployed there as of this moment? Uh, uh, the the force man. We we generally don't talk uh, numbers in 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 public here, Congressman. I'd be happy to. Happy what what to, can you say that that we can say in a public setting? Uh, that there's there's lots of reporting on this. What's what's a, a ballpark you could talk about? The we are we are at the level that uh, the, that uh, the Department of Defense has uh, has approved for us uh, in this in uh, in this area, and we'll we'll maintain that going forward. Is that public information? The level that the Department of Defense. Has I think that uh, that uh, the Office of Secretary of Defense has put some uh, some numbers out. I don't recall what their most recent one is, but uh, I'd be happy to follow up on that with you. Okay, and and so. Uh, I'd like to ask you how many U.S. service members are in Syria or operating in Syria. Um, I'm expecting to get a, a similar answer. Are you are you able to tell me? Right. I think uh, you know the the Department of Defense. I think is uh, is basically said about around 1,700 have been there. But again, uh, I, I would offer the same response to you in these. And in answer to Ms. Gabbard's question about um, what our purpose is, you responded that the sole and single task is to defeat ISIS. Is that, in fact, the, the reason for our military presence? That is the reason for our military and, presence. And with the defeat of ISIS, will we no longer have a military presence in Syria? Well, with, when 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 uh, we have completed our when we've completed our mission here in in uh, in Syria, it, it involves not only uh, kicking uh, ISIS out of the areas in which they occupy, but it also includes the consolidation and the consolidation of gains and the stability uh, that allows uh, allows us to move forward with a with a political resolution to this. So that. That's been defined for us by uh, by our leadership here, and so that's how we are uh, we are gauging our military support. That's part of the mission. The the first part of your answer is clear to me. If there are no longer um, ISIS combatants on on the battlefield, if we no longer have a threat from them, I, I think that's probably something we can measure. The second part sounds a little mushy. Could you define that in terms that I and my constituents can understand, so we will know when we have won and when service members can come back from Syria? Right. So what, we'll, what, we'll, what we will continue to do is support our partners on the ground to ensure that uh, the areas, we can consolidate our gains, uh, we can stabilize the area, we can ensure that uh, uh, international organizations, humanitarian aid organizations can come back and people can get into their, into their homes. And this is about creating the security environment that, uh, that allows that and, uh, and, uh, and provides the time for our diplomats uh, to pursue the the solution uh, uh, that they, that uh, that we are seeking through the United Nations in 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 Syria. So even after ISIS is gone, there, there is an indefinite military commitment from the United States of America. Uh, from from the description you just gave me, uh, what is the, what is the legal justification to be there after ISIS is no longer there? Well, the the. The, the fact is ISIS is still there, and that's what we're dealing with right but now. But the question I asked you is after ISIS is defeated and you've well, accomplished part that, of our, part of past, our, what is the legal justification for U.S. service members to be deployed in Syria? Well, the, 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 uh, the principal thing will be to ensure that, uh, that ISIS does not reemerge in this particular area. Even though they have been eliminated from, uh, from controlling terrain does not mean that ISIS is not present in this area. I think we've been very clear on that. So we have to ensure that, uh, that ISIS isn't given the opportunity to, to resurge here. With regard to your, uh, uh, your question on the, uh, on, the, uh, on the legal authority of this, again, I would cite that uh, you know, the principal, principal legal authority here was self-defense of, of Iraq in terms of this and the unwillingness and inability of the Syrian regime to provide for, uh, to address this particular threat that posed uh, a threat to not just the, the country of Syria and Iraq, but really to, the, to, to a much broader uh, group of, uh, of countries around the world. My understanding is that the administration has used the uh, 2001 authorization for the use of military force, uh, whose justification is premised on um, the attacks of 9-11 and 
um, stopping uh, those who attack this country from being able to do so again. And I think the logical conclusion of, of your answer to my question about our presence after ISIS is defeated is that the U.S. military can be in any and every country that there was ever an ISIS presence just so that there will not be an ISIS presence going forward. And I think that is a recipe for disaster. We will not have successful oversight or accountability or prosecution of that war because we cannot define its goals uh, or the strategy. Uh, I yield back. General, what happened when we left Iraq completely in 2009 after we had supposedly <clears throat> defeated al-Qaeda in Iraq? Uh, well, Chairman, uh, we, we saw the rise of ISIS and we saw the inability of the Iraqi security forces to effectively address it as it was, as it was growing. Okay. Mr. Heiss. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, General, according to the um, worldwide threat assessment, the most recent one, uh, Director Coates uh, and the intelligence community assessed that Iran's support for the Popular Mobilization Committee and Shia militants remain the primary threat to U.S. personnel in Iraq. Do you agree with that assessment? I, I, uh, Congressman, I, I do think they certainly could pose a threat to, uh, uh, to our forces on the ground. Uh, this is something we are very vigilant for uh, and are paying very, very close attention to. We have not seen that threat manifest itself at this particular point, uh, but it's certainly something that we are, uh, we are very cognizant of. How is uh, CENTCOM working with the Iraqi government and other regional partners to try to address this? Uh, well, the, you know, certainly the, the the Iraqi government has a has a law in place that addresses paramilitary forces, and uh, what we are, are doing as part of our broader security sector reform support that we provide to the to the government of Afghan of uh, of Iraq is encouraging them to take the steps for, to bring those forces to the right size and to ensure they have the right leadership, uh, and they are they are beholden to the government uh, government of Iraq. So the principal way that we will do this is through our advice and, and where necessary, our assistance to the, to, the, uh, to the government of Iraq. Okay. I'd like to follow up a little bit on uh, Mr. Gallagher's questions uh, a little while ago uh, and just kind of an overall perspective. Uh, what, what is CENTCOM's role in trying to curb Iranian influence, particularly in Iraq, but in the, in the entire region? Well, uh, you know, I, I think uh, one of the principal roles that we have is, 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 as I mentioned, is assuring our partners and building partnerships uh, around the region and helping our partners be resilient against this particular threat and making sure that they have the wherewithal uh, to, to, uh, to protect themselves. So certainly developing partnerships and assuring our partners is a key piece of this. Another key piece of this is making sure that we have the right military capabilities in place to deter Iran from taking action, particularly with their growing uh, and increasingly capable missile capability that they're, that they're developing. So we have a deterrence role. And then finally, I think we have a competition role. We have to challenge them uh, for some of the things that they are doing. And, and we, we certainly can do that militarily, but we can also do that with our other instruments of, of, of uh, national power that we have available for us. Okay. Thank you. And that uh, actually raises some questions that I think would probably be more appropriate in our next Thank session. You. But with that, Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back. Thank, Thank you. you. Mr. Bacon. Jeff Fotel, thank you for your leadership. And I appreciate and thank uh, the men and women who serve in the United States uh, Central Command. I was a four-time deployed a veteran of the command and, and proud of that. I'd like to drill a little more into the Iranian influence in Syria itself and that specific problem set. It, Iran has propped up. Assad, I think maybe more so than Russia, but the two together have clearly been working together. Uh, they got advisors, they have sent fighters to uh, Syria, uh, have encouraged Hezbollah to be supportive. Shia militants uh, from other countries have been sent there. They've sent weapons, cash, petroleum. Uh, they recently launched a drone, it appears. Uh, I think it was an Iranian drone versus a Syrian drone. So what I'm hearing from you, and, and please correct me if I'm wrong, if my characterization's not right, that we do have a grander strategy that focuses on Iran in your AOR, but in Syria itself, we really don't have a strategy that limits uh, Iran's influence in Syria. Is that, is that a true characterization? 
I'm not sure I would necessarily characterize it that way. You, we, there, there, there are things that are appropriate for the military to do, and that's the, that's the angle though, that I talk about, but there are certainly other parts of our government and other capabilities that we have as a, uh, within our national resources that, uh, that, uh, that can address uh, Iran's malign activities, whether they're in Syria or in other places. But you would agree it would be unacceptable for Iran to have a long-term presence in uh, Western Syria. Well, it, it would be unacceptable if that presence resulted in uh, in threats to our other partners or in further destabilization of the of the of the region. Would you say it's acceptable or unacceptable for Iran to build a land bridge from Iran through Iraq, Syria to the borders of Israel? I would say it's unacceptable if the purpose of that land bridge is to move lethal technologies and advanced capabilities in the hands of, of, uh, of other fighters who may use those to attack uh, their neighbors. What would you say was the, was the purpose of Iran launching that drone into Israel? Was that indeed Iran or could have been Syrian? I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not sure. I think that's probably a better question for the Iranians here <laughs> uh, in terms of that. Uh, There seems to be a recent decline in Iranian harassment of our ships in the Persian Gulf and in the Straits. Is that true, and why do you think that may be? Uh, I, it, it is true. We have seen a decrease in some of the interactions that we have seen. I think this is principally uh, because of some of the strong rhetoric uh, or the strong uh, discussion we have had about the lack of professionalism of Iranian uh, maritime forces and how they operate in this region. I think that uh, has got their attention. Uh, I also uh, do think they are, are uh, perhaps concerned about, uh, about our stronger position on, on some of our Iran's activities beyond just their nuclear weapons uh, program here, and so they're paying attention to that. I would tell you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Congressman, that one of the things we are concerned about is their increasing use of UAVs. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, while while we may see decreases with some of their activities in in this area, I'm equally concerned about their increasing use of UAVs that uh, that could pose a threat to our maritime activities in the region. Okay, thank you. Uh, are we actively interdicting shipments to the Hezbollah and, and Lebanon from Iran? Uh, I, I think that's probably beyond the discussion okay. in, this, in this room. Going back to a previous question on Joint Stars, <clears throat> we're being asked by the Air Force to determine, should we recapitalize the Joint Stars with a new uh, airframe or let that go away and go to some new capabilities? And we're getting conflicting advice and counsel on that. I'd love to have your perspective. Do you need more Joint Star capabilities or, or less? Or, or do you, well, you have thoughts uh, for us at the HASC? You know, uh, from as a combatant commander, uh, you know, we, uh, I'm, I'm very dependent upon the services to provide us the right capabilities, and and they they almost they always do, and we're very very satisfied with that. So I'm less concerned about which platform it on, is on, and more concerned with the with the capability that's that's coming our way. Certainly, the Joint Stars provides not only ground movement targeting indicator capability that's very important in my theater and other theaters, uh, but it also provides. Uh, you know, uh, battle space management, command and control that comes along with these are these are key capabilities. What I'm trying to achieve in in with our use of ISR is 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 layered ISR. I want to be able to draw all these capabilities into a into a into an ISR scheme that meets my requirements or meets our requirements in this particular theater. Well, again, thank you for being here today and answering <clears throat> our questions. We're grateful to you. Thank you. Yield back. Thank you, Mr. Hunter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. General, thank you for being here. Um, this just proves if, if you stick around long enough, you get to ask a question, whether you're good or not, if you're there. Um, I guess the, the first question is, we've, we've been working on getting some kinds of UAVs, whether they're, they're predators or they're whatevers, to our allies in the Middle East, whether it's Saudi Arabia, um, the Emirates, UAE, and we, we, we've been stopped. We've, we've even offered them the ability to use U.S. contractors to do it so that they can prosecute their own targets, and we can use them instead of using our, our, our own. So the question is, can we tolerate a reality where because of self-imposed constraints, we can't sell our allies our UAV technology, but the Chinese can, and, and you've already spoken to that point, but when it comes to technology, I think we're, we're missing a big advantage there. Could you comment on that? 
I think it's, uh, I think it's, you know, as you're alluding to here, I think the opportunity for us to improve our interoperability uh, through common systems, whether it's uh, ISR or other systems we have out here, I think these are always opportunities that we have to pursue uh, wherever we can. Do you support our, our us, us sharing our UAV technology with our allies? I certainly think it deserves uh, serious consideration. Thank you. <clears throat> um, the second question is, in terms of I, Iran and a rat line that goes from Iran through Syria down to Israel, I've, I've got big poster boards with Soleimani with his arm around every single I, Iraqi Corps commander and, and militia guy. Um, they're all, they're, all, they're all buddies. Soleimani is now handpicking the guys that we're equipping and training, but that's the fight that we're in right now. So the, the question is, and you've already spoken to this, but specifically, do you think it's gonna be possible to, to extract I, Iran out of Syria and I, Iraq if there's an end to what's happening in Syria? Because they're, they're dug in deeply now I, I, uh, I, I think there certainly <clears throat> is an opportunity in, uh, in Iraq through our strong relationships that we're developing here. And I think that, uh, you know, one of the things that, I, that, uh, that I've observed about, uh, about Iraq over the last year has been their outreach to other partners across the region, whether it's Jordan, whether it's Saudi Arabia, whether it's Kuwait, whether it's Turkey, the other key Sunni nations in the area. And so they are very much emerging as a, as a, uh, as a you know, trying to be much more involved involved in the region, which I think is a very uh, positive thing. And I think it, uh, it, uh, I think it connotes the fact that Ira Iraq is for Iraqis. Uh, and while they live in a difficult neighborhood with uh, difficult neighbors and they, and they have to deal with that, that they are principally concerned with but Iraq. Let's, but let's bring it back right now, because right, right, mm -hmm. right now we're playing the enemy of our enemy is our, our friend. That's, that's what we're playing right now. If the Iranians are the major power players with weapons and our, our training and our our gear right now with their hand-picked militia guys, the Iraqis can reach out all they want to. The, the power is with the Iranians in Iraq and Syria right now. Is that not where the power lies, in, in your opinion? The actual power, and I'm talking power by a force. Well, I, I think they, there certainly is uh, there's influence here, and there's no doubt about that. Uh, but again, I, I, I do see within the uh, Iraqi leadership a uh, very strong, uh, a very strong sense of, uh, of independence and a desire to to protect Iraq. Uh, and so, I think these are things that we have to continue to build on. And okay, so, so let me just lay it out then one last time. You're you're confident that in the next 10, 10 years. We're not going to see an Iranian-controlled rat line where the Iranians can, can go from Tehran through Syria down to Israel on a high-speed road with M M1 Abrams tanks that we've trained them on. You, you do not see that happening. I, I, Congressman, I wouldn't, I wouldn't speculate in that particular regard. I, what I would tell you is I think our best opportunity to prevent something like that is to stay engaged and to— I wouldn't uh, disagree with you on that. And, and, to, and, to, and to continue to be the valuable partner that we have been for them uh, and, uh, and to continue to professionalize their, uh, their forces and their capabilities so that uh, they, are, uh, uh, they are beholden to themselves, not beholden to others uh, to do things for them. And they don't allow their terrain to be exploited in the, in the right. manner that you highlighted. As you've seen, General, as we train and equip and try to pick sides, we are not always right on who we end up helping. And that's turned around to, uh, you know, bite us a few times. And I, I, I really hope that right now with the Iranians, we're not doing that in a much bigger way than we've messed up in the past. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. General, I, I want to follow on two questions that I don't think you've been asked directly. Um, you started the hearing talking about uh, considerable success in the fight to eliminate ISIS from controlling any territory. Is there or will there be a reduction in U.S. people and U.S. capabilities from Iraq, especially, uh, due to that success? Well, as part of our, uh, part of our alignment process, there already has been. And, uh, you know, the, the success we've had has given us the ability to move some of these critical resources, whether it's ISR or fighter aircraft or some of our engineering capability or medical capability that we had uh, when required on the ground. And we've been able to reposition that within the theater, Afghanistan in particular, to make sure that General Nicholson has what he needs to be successful. So we already have seen that. And, of course, as, as the situation continues to
to mature, we will continue to make smart decisions on this. We don't want to keep one more soldier, one more piece of equipment there than than is needed to support the mission, and uh, and that's what uh, that's what we're that's what we're pursuing, uh, but we're trying to do it as smartly as we can. Yeah, because we also don't want to repeat the mistakes of the past uh, and and leave completely. The other the other thing at one point. Uh, the assessment we got was the most capable terrorist enemy we faced was AQAP, especially in their bomb making and, and so forth. You've talked a little bit about uh, Al Qaeda and ISIS in Yemen. Is there still a terrorist threat that emanates from Yemen? Uh, there is, uh, Chairman, and, and and I think our uh, first of all, I, I think our our off our efforts over the last year have been very effective at addressing many of the concerns that we had with uh, uh, with Al, with Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, and I think we have uh, we have uh, we have uh, addressed their leadership, their media capability, their external operations capability, certainly some of their explosive uh, capability that uh, has been inherent in this organization. But I think with Al Qaeda, I think it's important to always understand what their long long-term objectives are. And they are a very patient and savvy organization. And I think we always have to be concerned about Al-Qaeda. And so it is, it is absolutely vital to not take the pressure off now, but to keep the pressure on them uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and make sure that we complete uh, this, this effort against them. <clears throat> yeah, I, I just, while, while it's a complex situation, you talked about the humanitarian, the Houthis, and, and all that's going on. Uh, I just think it's important not to lose sight of the fact that there continues to be a terrorist threat that, that emanates from there. Um, I think that uh, we're good for now. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, we will adjourn this open session and within about five minutes reconvene upstairs. Thank you.